This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Neat Sahone, and it's time for another MTG Top 10. Most of the time in this series, I look at the best or worst cards in a particular category, but sometimes I like to do lists that are historical retrospectives, where I look at something a little bit different, and that's what we're doing today with a look at the 10 cards that got banned the fastest. This is actually the second time I'll be doing this topic. I did it the first time in July of 2019, but over the last four years, the list has changed a lot, as many cards have needed to be banned quickly. I'll let you decide whether this is a result of Wizards of the Coast printing too many powerful cards, or the fact that they're just responding more quickly to them, but whatever the reason, this list is very different than it was last time. There are a few ties on the list, so some slots on it have multiple cards, so this isn't quite as impressive as it sounds, but it is still notable that there are seven cards on this list that weren't on it in 2019. The cards in this video and the order in which they are ranked is based on how many days there were between the date a set released and the date a card was banned. We're going to start with a quick look at the four cards that were on the list last time, but didn't make it this time. Starting with Smuggler's Copter, which got banned in standard 101 days after being printed. This time around, it took getting banned in 56 days or fewer to make the list, giving you a pretty good indication of how the list has changed. And while how quickly this got banned doesn't seem quite as impressive today, Smuggler's Copter was an insanely powerful card and all of Standard warped around it. This two mana vehicle is a 3-3 with flying and crew 1 and it loots every time you attack or block with it. It was very easy to crew, so it was effectively a two mana 3-3 three, three with flying that looted when it attacked or blocked. Being a vehicle also meant sorcery speed creature removal could usually not deal with it, so it gave aggro decks a huge leg up against sweepers, and basically creature based decks was all you could play when the copter was legal in the format because it was just that good. It was inherently powerful, but it got even more of an upgrade in the standard format it was a part of because there were plenty of payoffs for artifacts, vehicles, and discarding cards. On top of all of that, it's also colorless, so you could just jam it into every deck, and that's exactly what happened. This led to it getting banned only 101 days after being printed. There's also Mental Misstep, which got banned in Modern just 94 days after being printed in New Phyrexia. Misstep costs one blue Phyrexian mana, which means you can either pay two life or one blue mana for it, and it can counter a one mana spell. While the restriction might seem significant, you'd be surprised how many things Misstep can counter, especially in formats like Modern Legacy and Vintage. The fact Misstep costs Phyrexian mana effectively made it colorless and free, too. That makes it kind of like Smuggler's Copter, since it was a powerful card everyone had access to if they wanted to play it, and it was really leading to some boring games of magic that were often determined by whoever drew the most mental missteps. It was subsequently also banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage. Next, there's Felidar Guardian, which got banned in standard 92 days after making its debut in Aether Revolt. The Guardian costs two generic and a white, it's a 1-4, and when it enters the battlefield it lets you exile a permanent you control and return it to the battlefield. This card may seem fairly unassuming at first, but the big problem is that it was a two-card early game combo alongside Sahili Rai. Sahili's minus two could make a copy of the Guardian, the Guardian could blink Sahili, and then when she came back, she could use her minus two again to copy the Guardian, and you can just do that until you have lethal damage. Generally, they don't like putting early game two card combos in standard, and this one snuck right past them, as they would later admit. This is what led to it getting banned so quickly. It also eventually got banned in Pioneer. The last card that is no longer on the list this time is Mishra's Workshop, which got restricted 73 days after being printed in Antiquities. At the time, Magic didn't have formats. Instead, there was just Magic, so at the time it was restricted for all Magic you could play. The Workshop is an insanely powerful land that can tap for three mana. Sure, the mana can only be spent on artifact spells, but even in Magic's early days, there were enough powerful artifacts you could accelerate into, and with it around as a full four of, artifact-heavy decks were going to be a huge part of the metagame. The ban and restricted list made its debut back in 1994, and what they were trying to do was make the game more fair ahead of the very first world championship. So they restricted many cards, and it definitely made sense to go after the workshop. In the long run, it's definitely proved to be one of the most powerful lands in all of Magic, as it powers one of the top decks in Magic's most powerful format, Vintage. 
But even as quickly as Mitra's workshop got restricted, it wasn't quite enough to make the list this time. Let's move now to the list itself with our number 10 card, which is actually three cards, all of which are from Antiquities, and they all got restricted 56 days after being printed. Those cards are Candelabra of Thanos, Feldon's Cane, and Ivory Tower. They all got the axe in one of Magic's earliest ban and restricted announcement, coming about a month ahead of the announcement in which Mitra's workshop was restricted. Unlike the Workshop, none of these cards seem overly powerful today, and none of them are currently banned in any formats, but all of them were much better in Magic's early days. The Candelabra is a one-mana artifact, and you can pay X and tap it to untap that many lands. You might be thinking, hey, it doesn't say tap on the card, and you'd sort of be right, but because it has the now-defunct mono artifact type, which at the time meant you had to tap it when you used it, and you could only use it once a turn, it has since received an erratum that tapping is just part of the effect. So it does tap today, and it does say it on the card according to Oracle. The Candelabra was too good with super powerful lands, like the aforementioned Workshop and Library of Alexandria, so it got restricted. Feldon's Cane is a one-mana artifact that you can tap and exile to shuffle your graveyard into your library. The biggest concern about the Cane was that it allowed you to get multiple uses out of really powerful restricted cards, like Ancestral Recall or Time Walk. So the DCI at the time viewed it as undermining the whole idea of the restricted list, so they decided to limit it to one per deck. Ivory Tower is a one-mana artifact that gains you X life during your upkeep, where X is the number of cards in your hand, minus four. During Magic's early days, creatures were way worse than they are today, and decks we would call control decks were dominant, and Ivory Tower was a big part of that. You would hold on to a ton of cards in these decks, so paying only one mana meant you would gain a ton of life for the investment and make it virtually impossible for anyone to ever beat you by attacking you. Ivory Tower got restricted to give creature decks more of a chance. At number 9, there are four cards. Three of them are from Urza Saga, and they all got banned in multiple formats 50 days after being printed. The other card is Maze of Ith, which got restricted 50 days after being printed in the dark. Let's start with a look at the maze because it's the older card. The maze is a land that can't actually tap for mana, something we basically never see these days but was quite common during Magic's first few years. However, it does come with an ability, and it's a good one, because you can tap it to untap an attacking creature and prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and dealt by that creature. This means you can use it to blank an opposing attacker, or use it to save one of your own creatures if combat goes sideways. Like Ivory Tower, this was a card that made life incredibly good for control decks, as it didn't cost any mana to play or use this ability, making it very easy for control decks to just ignore opposing attackers. Now let's take a look at the Urza's Saga cards. Urza Saga is famously one of Magic's most broken sets, and just looking at these three cards does a pretty good job of indicating that. Talarian Academy is a land that can produce one blue for every artifact in play when you tap it. Windfall has both players discard their hand, and then both players draw cards equal to the largest number of cards that were discarded that way. And Stroke of Genius costs X mana, two, and a blue, and it's an instant that makes target player draw X cards. These three cards all got the axe because of the exact same deck, Academy Combo. The deck used Mind Over Matter to untap Academy repeatedly, and if you combine that with powerful draw spells, like Windfall and Stroke of Genius, you would continue to have plenty of cards to discard for Mind Over Matter's ability, producing insane amounts of mana. Eventually, you'd take all that mana and pump it into a Stroke of Genius that forces your opponent to draw their entire library. Because of fast mana and tutors, the deck was incredibly consistent and could go off incredibly early. The Academy Combo deck kicked off a period known as Combo Winter, a time from late 1998 into early 1999 when busted Urza's block cards made combo decks like Academy Combo dominant in every single Magic format. In the end, Talarian Academy and Windfall both got banned or restricted in every single Magic format, while Stroke of Genius got banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage. At number 8, it is Lingering Souls, which got banned in Innistrad Block Constructed 46 days after being printed in Dark Ascension. It costs 2 generic and a white, and it makes 2 1-1 flying creature tokens, and it has flashback for 1 generic and a black, which means it can be cast from your graveyard for that cost, and then you exile it. Lingering Souls is undoubtedly a powerful card, as it ultimately can give you 4 1-1 flying bodies with only a single card. You can of course also decide to discard it for value before flashing it back. It was especially busted and block constructed where token decks were dominant, especially because Intangible Virtue was around, which would offer a huge buff to your entire board. Ultimately, they decided to ban both Lingering Souls and Intangible Virtue to keep token decks from making up the entire metagame at the block constructed Pro Tour. 
The fact that Lingering Souls also got banned shows you just how good it is, because even without Intangible Virtue around, it was still too good for the format. After all, it's a card that has had a long history in formats with much larger card pools, just based on how amazing it is in terms of its rate. In Block Constructed, a format with an especially small card pool, it was easily the most powerful card in the block. At number 7, I've got two cards from Throne of Eldraine that got banned in multiple formats 45 days after being printed. As with Urza's Saga, Throne of Eldraine has gained a deserved reputation as a set with a ton of busted cards that warped multiple magic formats, and Oko and Once Upon a Time were the set's biggest defenders, resulting in both of them getting banned in Standard, Pioneer, and Modern, and Oko also got banned in Legacy. Oko has a pretty strong claim to the title of Most Powerful Planeswalker of All Time. He costs one generic, a blue, and a green, and starts with four loyalty. He comes with a plus two that makes a food token, and a minus five that lets you exchange control of cheap permanents, but the ability that really makes Oko busted is his plus one, which lets you turn any artifact or creature into a 3-3 elk with no abilities. You can use this to animate a food token or otherwise upgrade some of your other permanents, but you can also use it to nerf opposing permanents. That flexibility and power turned out to be too much for every single format apart from Vintage. During those days he was legal in all of those formats, he was seeing incredibly heavy play in all of them. Once Upon a Time isn't quite as busted, as evidenced by the fact that it remains legal in Legacy, but it's still pretty nuts. It costs one generic and a green and lets you look at the top five cards of your library, then you reveal a creature or land and put it into your hand. It is especially insane that if it's the first spell you cast in the game, you can cast it for free. Anytime you get something for free, it tends to be pretty good, and this effect is especially nice because it can make your deck so much more consistent. These bans helped restore order to Magic's formats, but it wouldn't last that long, because 2020 was also a year that featured lots of busted cards that had to be quickly banned, like the two cards that are tied for the number 6 slot on the list. Luris of the Dream Den and Zerda, the Dawn Waker, both of which got banned 32 days after being printed in Akoria. Both of these have Companion, a mechanic that immediately proved to be a major issue. They all come with a deck building requirement, and if you meet it, you get to start with that card in your sideboard, and you could cast it directly from it. At least, that's how it originally worked. They ended up having to nerf the mechanic because it ended up being way too good in basically every format. These days you have to pay 3 generic to put a companion into your hand before you can ever cast it. These were the first two companions that proved to be a problem for 60 card competitive formats. Luris is by far the best of the companions. He costs 1 generic and 2 Orzhov hybrid mana, he's a 3-2 with lifelink, and once a turn you can cast a permanent card with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard. The companion requirement is simply that each permanent in your deck has to have a mana value of 2 or less. This means, in other words, that Luris is going to be able to cast a permanent card from your graveyard every single turn. That generates a ton of card advantage and can even result in some absurd combos. Luris slotted into a whole lot of decks in multiple formats without them having to change themselves too much, especially in Legacy and Vintage, formats with very low average mana costs. The biggest problem with Luris is that the companion requirement is just too easy. It only checks your permanence, and that means you can still run a ton of more expensive cards as long as they're instants and sorceries. Anyway, the point is, starting with Luris as an extra card in your opening hand was nuts and way too easy to accomplish, leading to it getting banned in Legacy in May 2020. Notably, it also got banned in Vintage, something they almost never do. Generally, cards only get restricted in Vintage, but obviously restricting Luris to one per deck wouldn't have made enough of a difference because of the companion mechanic. Luris would eventually be unrestricted in Vintage in 2021 after the companion mechanic got nerfed, but it remains banned in Pioneer, Modern, and Legacy. Zerda wasn't nearly as much of a multi-format problem, at least. Instead, it just ended up being too good for Legacy. It costs 1 generic and 2 Boros hybrid mana for a 3-3 that makes your activated abilities cost 2 less to activate. You can also pay 1 generic and tap it to make a creature unable to block for a turn. Zerda's companion requirement is far more restrictive than Luris's, because every permanent in your deck has to have an activated ability. That requirement is what kept Zerda from making a significant mark on other formats, but in Legacy it enabled an easy to assemble infinite mana combo. If you had Zerda and either Basalt Monolith or Grim Monolith in play, you could tap them for mana and use some of that mana to activate their own untap ability, netting mana every time you do it. Because of the companion mechanic, this meant you could effectively always have easy access to one half of the combo in Zerda, and all you had to do was find a monolith and you could go off. 
In a lot of ways, it made it feel like a one-card combo. This led to Zerta getting banned in Legacy, and even after the companion mechanic got nerfed, it has remained banned in the format. At number 5, it is Omnath Locus of Creation, which got banned in Standard a mere 17 days after being printed in Zendikar Rising. He got one of every color of mana except for black, and he's a 4-4 that draws you a card when he enters the battlefield. Then he comes with an incredibly powerful land trigger. Whenever your first land in a turn enters, you gain 4 life. When the second one enters, you get back 4 mana. And when the third one enters, he does 4 damage to each opponent and each planeswalker they control. The biggest problem with Omnath was that it was too easy to get multiple landfall triggers a turn, so netting all three of these effects on multiple turns was commonplace, and when you're doing that, while also ramping your mana, it's pretty impossible for you to lose. Escape to the Wilds and Fabled Passage helped make this happen along with Beanstalk Giant and Lucky Clover. Even just getting two landfall triggers in a single turn was often enough to win you the game, and the deck could achieve that with ease. These decks could rapidly ramp their mana far too easily while building an insurmountable advantage thanks to all the life you can gain and all the damage Omnath can do. One of the nastiest things about Omnath is that the fail case is still a two-for-one thanks to its Enter the Battlefield ability, so even if it was dealt with immediately, the player who removed Omnath still often found themselves behind. All of that power led to Omnath getting banned out of standard incredibly quickly. At number four, it is Memory Jar, which got banned or restricted in every Magic format 14 days after being printed in Urza's Legacy. Earlier in the video, we saw that a bunch of Academy combo cards got banned to kick off Combo Winter. Well, Broken Jar was the key card in the last deck of Combo Winter. The Jar is a 5-mana artifact that you can tap and sacrifice to make both players exile their hand and draw 7 cards. Then at the next instep, both players discard all those cards and return the exiled cards to their hand. This is crazy powerful, all on its own, as if your opponent is tapped out, you can take advantage of all those sweet cards, and your opponent won't ever get the chance. Second, you can combine it with Megrim for a very quick kill because your opponent had to discard their hand during that instep. That meant they would take a minimum of 14, but the deck usually found a way to chain together more than one memory jar in a turn. It could do this thanks to a ton of absurd fast mana and tutors. It had to be banned quickly once it became clear that it was utterly broken, and Wizards of the Coast actually announced an emergency ban once that happened. That's a big part of what led to it getting banned so quickly. At number 3, it is Tybalt's Trickery, which got banned in Modern only 10 days after being printed in Kaldheim. Trickery is an instant that costs 1 generic and a red, and it counters a spell. Then, 1, 2, or 3 are randomly chosen, and the controller of that spell mills that many cards, then exiles cards from the top of their library until they reveal a non-land card with a different name than the countered spell. Then, the card can be cast without paying its mana cost. Obviously, this isn't usually something you're going to want to use to counter an opposing spell, as you're pretty likely to accidentally upgrade the situation for your opponent. Instead, Trickery is at its best when you counter your own spell to cheat something into play. In Modern, this was especially problematic alongside Cascade. If you cast a card with Cascade, like Violent Outburst, you can make sure you always cascade it into Tybalt's Trickery if you didn't have any other cards in your deck that cost less than 3 mana. Then you can use the trickery to actually counter the outburst, which will then give you a random spell. At that point, if the deck is built correctly, trickery can usually cheat a massive creature into play like Emrakul. It can also hit another cascade spell, but if that happens, you just get another shot. The combo can whiff if you hit another trickery with a trickery, but it could be fairly consistent to power out very early Emrakuls. Interestingly, Wizards of the Coast didn't ban this card only because it was good in Modern. Instead, they thought the deck was miserable to play against or with, since the entire game was usually riding on a roll of the dice. The deck probably would be a Tier 1 deck in Modern, but it probably wasn't actually too good for Modern. It was just that they didn't want a deck with a significant metagame share to be this unfun. That's why they quickly banned it. At number 2, it is Mind's Desire, which got banned in Legacy and restricted in Vintage only 6 days after being printed in Scourge. For 4 generic and 2 blue, Mind's Desire shuffles your library, and then you exile the top card of your library from the game. You can then play that card without paying its mana cost. The key to the card's insane power, though, is the Storm mechanic, which means when you cast this, you put an extra copy of it on the stack for each other spell that has been cast this turn. Legacy and Vintage, even back then, had far too many ways to draw a bunch of cards, play cheap spells and rituals, and then cast a Mind's Desire with such a high storm count that you would simply cast your entire library in a single turn, ending the game on the spot. 
Storm made it particularly difficult to interact with, too, because it meant that simply countering Mind's Desire wouldn't do the job, because all those other copies would still resolve. This was so obviously a problem for the Eternal formats that they axed the card before it even really had a chance to be played in either format, and it remains banned in Legacy and Restricted in Vintage today. And at number one, it's Lutri the Spell Chaser, which got banned in Commander during Akoria preview season. For a little while, I wasn't sure I wanted to include Lutri on this list, as Commander is a very different animal than the 60 card formats, but in the end it was pretty hard not to talk about Lutri on a list like this because he was banned so incredibly fast. Lutri is the third companion to appear on the list. He costs one generic and two is it hybrid mana, and he's a 3-2 with flash that can copy an instant or sorcery when it enters the battlefield. His companion requirement is that each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name. If you know Commander's deck construction rules, you can see why this is a problem. After all, it's a format where you're almost always playing a singleton deck, so literally every Commander deck that could play a card with an is it identity would have access to this companion. I've already explained how broken Companion is in a general sense, and Lutri giving you this much of an advantage would lead to a lot of players making sure their Commander had an identity that would allow you to have access to Lutri. Obviously, this would have made the format thoroughly uninteresting and limited the number of decks people would play, so the Commander Rules Committee chose to ban it the minute it was revealed. They didn't really need to wait and see with this card, as just reading the text box would indicate how big of a problem it was for Commander. So, those are the cards that got banned or restricted the most quickly in all of Magic's history. If you want to own any of these banned or restricted cards, check out the description where you can find a Direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to see past MTG Top 10s, and at this point there are over 615 of them, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. And lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel, you can do so by becoming a patron or a channel member. You can find ways to do those things in the description. Thanks for watching.